Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense, common knowledge, or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do, but only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have Nicholas P. Money. He goes by Nick. Uh, He's a professor, uh, director of what's called the Western Program at Miami University. He's been coming out with a series of uh, super interesting books, the latest of which is called Nature Fast and Nature Slow. A life works from fractions of a second to billions of years. He's also been a mycologist, you know, studying mushrooms and fungi, et cetera, for many, many years. And I want to talk to him about his new book. So, Nick, thanks for coming. Hey, my pleasure. Good to talk to you again. Yeah. So, what? Um, you know, tell me what the new book's about, and then you know, we'll get into the inspiration to it, uh, why you created it, et cetera. What's the new book about? Yeah. So, what I uh, some to begin at the beginning. The book is some. Um, so, it's it's a relatively short book consists of 10 chapters and each of the chapters concerns a particular time interval. So the book begins by looking at the way that natural mechanisms operate within the time span of fractions of a second. And then in the final chapter, I'm looking at the longest uh, time span of which we're we're aware in the universe, which is the um, passage of billions of years. So I'm looking at fractions of a second, as the subtitle says, through billions of years. And in between, I look at the way that nature works from second to second, minute to minute, and so on. So it's this, this, and I treat this in terms of orders of magnitude using seconds as the the time base. So I'm just providing examples in in the book of the way that, that nature plays out over this this immense time span and but looking at actually what what we are able to to perceive what we're able to measure ourselves and see for ourselves but then also that that so much of the time span or the timeline of nature is really hidden from us well, why why the focus on time to begin with what uh, got you thinking about this subject probably because i'm approaching the age of, of of 60 and so time's running out and so i thought i'd look at uh, Look at the way that biology works in relation to time. I'm not sure about the real answer to that question. The real answer probably is that during the more active research phase of my career as a scientist, I I specialized in looking at very fast mechanisms, things that happen on the time scale of milliseconds or, or microseconds, so millionths of a second. And these were the physical mechanisms that that I found fascinating. And I wanted to look at how those actually work within this longer span of of nature and look at the, about the way that those mechanisms contribute to the the way that nature works over indeed the course of or has worked over the course of billions of years on this planet i mean did you feel like again because you said now you're approaching 60 that your time has gone fast so far like what's you know did you ever think about writing a book about how you personally have experienced time or how people experience themselves or yeah, I mean, I, and certainly that does hopefully that does come through in this book there's that there's some 
uh, personal experience here, but also the way that all of us do experience time. I mean, John Milton, the the English poet, famously, well, famously for those of us that, that are obsessed with John Milton, wrote that time is the subtle thief of youth, such that you know, when we're focused on it, we can we can we can count in in seconds, and we can experience the passage of time second by second. But we find ourselves too soon, perhaps, or very soon, with decades behind us. How is it that we get here? It's uh, it is surprising, I think, how how fast time passes. I think that as yeah. a boy, I was sort of waiting for things to get going. You know, time seemed to proceed more slowly, and then now as a a late middle-aged man, things seem very different from the perspective of somebody that's been around for six decades. So what are what are some of your favorite stories that you discovered when you're researching the book? Well, starting with, um, I mean, starting with the fast mechanisms, the way that things operate over just slivers of, of time, I was very interested to really get into the the literature. The way that I, that I, I write is I do an immense amount of, of reading about different about the different topics that I'm going to be covering, and this is fascinating for me as somebody that spent most of my professional life studying fungi. I find it absolutely fascinating and inspiring to look at the way that other kinds of organisms work. And I was particularly struck as I was looking at the fractions of a second chapter, but the way that jellyfish nematocysts operate, and these are probably some of the fastest physical movements where our biological structure is moving from one place, one spot to another at an immense speed. So actually these, these nematocysts are the stingers, the things that jellyfish use to sting us when we brush against them and other kinds of organisms too. Sea anemones and other kinds of microorganisms also use nematocysts. But anyway, that they're actually, these things accelerate at immense speeds that they travel short distances when they actually interact with our skin, but they're, they're traveling at millions of G, absolutely immense speeds. And so to actually capture that movement, you have to use video cameras that are, that are running at millions of frames or at least a million frames a second to see anything. And actually even at a million frames a second, there's still some blurring in that image as this dart just travels across this short distance. It's a, it's an extraordinary, it's an extraordinary piece of evolutionary artillery that she makes this, this work. And it's, it's a pressure driven structure. It's a, it's, it actually, yeah, it's pressurized. It uses probably some osmotic me- mechanism to actually generate hydrostatic pressure. At least that's one of the prevailing ideas about the way that they operate. And then it's, it's a little lid opens at the tip of this structure and bang, this, this dart flies out and delivers, in some cases, delivers poison to the, to the organism that the jellyfish or other sea creature is interacting with. Yeah, I've heard there's a, a punching shrimp that can, I guess, punch with tremendous force or tremendous speed. Was that included in your book? Or? Yeah, so there's, there are, there are others. So the mantis shrimp is the, the famous example of this with this, this, um, it uses its claws to, 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 to bash its way into shellfish. And yet you know, it's, it's an immense, it's moving also at an immense speed. It's not as fast as a nematocyst, but it's, it's pretty impressive. And there's many, many other examples that we can see. We can look at, talk about the way that fleas and other insects jump and the way that this mechanism works. It's, it's referred to as power amplification. So the energy is stored in some fashion by the anatomy of these the creatures like, uh, as I say, fleas and then also the mantis shrimp. And then they release this structure. So in the case of the mantis shrimp, it's the claw that pounds down. In the case of the flea, then it's the, the legs that extend and, and then the movement occurs. But these movements are all too fast for us to actually observe naturally. We, we can't, can't observe these mechanisms in action, which is why we have to use high speed cameras to actually observe, to capture, to study these, these beautiful mechanisms. Are some of the stories or things you found that didn't make it into the book, but that interested you, interests you, or would entice the reader to, to read? Well, I, I suppose one thing I, I didn't dwell on too much was actually the, the the research that I've performed myself and with students over the years, looking at all of these fast fast movements that we see in in fungi and other microorganisms. And this this just there's so much out there. I mean, it really is this sort of hidden hidden universe, this this parallel universe of, of of microscopic organisms going about their business at immense speed, you know, completely unseen until we we seek to slow things down with uh, using the technology of high speed speed video. I mean, we can look at fast movements too. I mean the fastest 
there's no shortage of examples of of animals that move very, very swiftly. Pronghorn antelope, for example, that I've actually watched them myself out in eastern Colorado in the areas where uh, gas exploration hasn't destroyed the environment. But you can see pronghorn antelope scampering ap- across the uh, the short grass prairie out there. I mean, that they can clock a speed that's close to that of a cheetah over a relatively short distance, but 98 kilometers an hour. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click support us today. Now back to the show. And uh, one one thing I found fascinating about, in, indeed, the pronghorn antelope in, in North America is that they, other than humans, I mean, they don't have natural predators that are a great threat to their survival, at least the adult animals. And it's thought that these very high speeds that they can clock actually developed, was was selected long ago when there were species of cheetah that lived in North America. And so what we're looking at really is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a holdover one. It's, it's an evolutionary relic of a time when these, these antelope or their ancestors were escaping from these very fast-moving predators. I, I find that a fascinating, fascinating story. Well, what, what are some, um, you know, I'll focus on animals still for now. What are, what are some natural phenomena that happen incredibly slowly that are interesting for animals that move incredibly slowly? Yeah, that's that, that's a good thing. I was looking at, I mean, in, when I look at the longer timescales in the book, I'm, I'm in, indeed, I look in the end at, uh, towards the end of the book, at evolutionary mechanisms that play out over, over that, that speed, but if with over long periods of time, but looking at very slow movements, I mean, we can, we can think about the growth of certain plants for example so i suppose a good example there would be if we look at the 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 oldest lived individual plants so the bristlecone pine for example the famous bristlecone pine of the american american west that you know lives in very dry soils and can survive for thousands of years i mean the oldest bristlecone pines are 4,900 years old, but they're growing extremely slowly. And so we actually have to use, in some cases, you have to actually look at, use a microscope to actually count the tree tree rings because they're only expanding at these sort of fractions of millimeter, fractions of a millimeter over the course of some, some years. So very, very slow growth rate. So you can look at a same bristle comb pine with a time lapse camera taking a photograph every year, and you you probably wouldn't see a great deal, a great deal of movement there. But nevertheless, over the course of centuries and millennia, absolutely, these plants are twisting themselves out of the dry soils and and changing their shape, forming new leaves. I mean, even even the, even individual leaves can persist for decades, if not for, for many decades, anyway, on trees like bristle comb pines. And there's plenty of other oh. other trees that grow very African based baobab the african baobab for example also not as old as the bristlecone pine but those those trees can grow for 2000 years i think are the oldest uh, baobabs that have been aged well why do some creatures move very fast and some very slow why do you think there's uh, you know such a different clock mechanism in different animals that it can be orders and orders of magnitude different yeah so so i mean these are what we're looking at are adaptations if we're thinking about particularly in terms of the movement of the whole organism that we're looking there at adapt- adaptations to different environmental conditions. And so we can, we can look at, so some of the longest lived vertebrate animals live in the deep ocean and in cold water, other cold water environments. So there's the, the, the ocean, uh, ocean quay hog, which is an Arctic, what, an Arctic clam. And so that's one of the longest lived or not, or if not the longest lived individual animal. So they've been famous individual that was actually aged to be over 500 years, years old. But again, that's a pretty, 
the ocean quahog doesn't do a great deal. That isn't something that's racing around in its in its ocean environment. I mean, it is filter feeding on the on the cold water that it draws in into its shell. But um, yeah, it's a slow moving animal. It, it seems to be perfectly suited to its cold water environment. It's acquiring enough nutrients without having to race around and capture them just by sitting there and filter feeding. And so you can apply the same kind of observations, the same kind of logic to look at other slow moving animals. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. But the other thing, too, is to to recognize that although maybe an animal itself isn't racing around like a pronghorn antelope, there are individual processes that are occurring within its tissues that are that, that are indeed taking place at very very high speeds we can look at biochemistry is occurring biochemical reactions metabolic reactions are occurring very very swiftly in fractions of a fractions of a second even if the animal appears to be perhaps we call it lethargic and i mean that in a pejorative fashion but yeah so we there are fast moving fish there are slow moving fish like the, the Greenland shark moves very slowly in, in, in the, its cold water in environment, at least most of the time, moves slowly. I and mean, then it might, might actually might actually speed up when it actually engulfs its, engulfs its prey. But it seems to be it's, it's, it's not racing around in the sea like a tuna. So are you, are you satisfied with your treatment of time scales in nature? Or in writing this book, what has it told you? How has it changed your thinking? It's changed my thinking in the sense that it's shown me how limited we are in our in our purview in it, of time that we are so fixated seconds and there are very very good reasons for this but the rest of time is is missed unless we're actually studying it if you think about it that so we can count seconds we could do this now and count seconds and we would be aware of each second as it passed we kind of live in the past tense but we would we would count those seconds but it's very very difficult to stay concentrating on that process and actually to count minutes or longer lengths of time when we, we just don't do this this isn't the way that we're we're wired so in terms of our experience of the present yeah we, we do that on a second by second basis but i just find it interesting that there's so much more going on both at much faster time scales but also at much longer time scales and indeed we're we're we are really very limited in the way that we perceive time we can look at the night sky and we can think about the immense age of the structures that we're perceiving or rather how long it took for the light from distant stars to get to us but we're still doing this on a on a second by second basis that experience of looking at the stars and we need to get more poetic i i think to try and make sense of this these these immense time scales and similarly we're thinking about things that occur very very swiftly there's a good deal of creativity and an imagine and imagination that goes into into this this process do you see that animals that move very quickly have very fast again activities or motions has anyone looked at how they perceive time versus animals that move very slowly yeah so that's a that's a really interesting interesting phenomenon that so indeed animals different species of animal have what's referred to as, as different flicker fusion frequencies which really refers to the way that they they're they're downloading i suppose or processing visual images and that then actually that our speeds actually the speed at which humans actually are processing the the visual environment actually changes over over our our lifetimes and so there's some beautiful experiments that have been done a lot of this work is classical physiological studies on insects for example that that show that insects including the dragonfly is has a much much faster flicker fusion rate than us so that it's um downloading much more information per unit time per second th than us which enables it to respond very very swiftly to movements in its environment i had a friend years ago a biologist who actually worked on insect flight and i asked him once what he thought was the the most beautiful insect in terms of its flying skills and he said oh, no no matter no, no doubt about it it's 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 one of the dragonflies in terms of their their aerobatics and their maneuverability and so that's part of the reason that the dragonfly and if you look at a dragonfly's head too with these enormous eyes and the, the, the amount of its brain that's actually dedicated to to its visual system yeah this is uh 
this animal is 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 very very responsive to to its environment on a somewhat shorter time scale than we're able to to deal with but we have different constraints we have different limitations that have been imposed by natural selection and different assets that have that have evolved during that time period during the time what evolutionary time but also during it during our lives that it seems that there's there's evidence perhaps that infants human infants actually have a faster flicker fusion frequency than an adult of my age which makes sense in adaptive terms in that an infant is downloading huge amounts of information everything is new to the new to the newborn it needs to once it opens its eyes it needs to be acquiring information and a lot of information very very as swiftly as it can while it's so vulnerable to actually begin to make sense of its in, environment and its surroundings whereas when one is somewhat older we novel experiences are somewhat rarer and so this may explain partly why we're, we're slowing down i'm just i'm not acquiring Acquiring as much new information or bothering to process it in the way that an infant would well, be. We're slowing down, but it seems like time is passing faster for us, which is a weird. That, that, that's right, and it is a trade-off. So that is one one idea of why is it that that experience? What? Why do we experience? the have the experience of time speeding up as we we get older well part of that could be related to this whole issue of flicker fusion frequencies that 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 we're if if we're down downloading sort of less information per unit time or per per year the year by definition then seems to pass more swiftly there's less going on whereas for for an for an infant there's so much information that's being packed into just as much to a single year you know when when you're a when you're a when you're a kid, that may explain partly why the experience of childhood is one of, of you know, the summer's stretch seemingly endlessly, whereas in adulthood, years pass, seem to pass more swiftly. Yeah, definitely. So what has this inspired you to look at next? You know, I know the book just came out, but, you know, do you have your sights set on other topics now because of this? Now, one, one thing I thought, I and mean, this is a sort of longer term idea, is that what one can look at is this idea of looking at or my idea of looking at nature in different ways and trying to examine the natural world from different perspectives. So in this book, it was based upon time. So nature fast and nature slow. I think it'll be interesting at some point to actually look at look at the spatial scale and look at, you know, nature big and nature small or nature small and nature big that, that we've also got orders of magnitude obviously in the size of individual organisms but we could we could review that all the way from the size of the the size of biological molecules all the way up to the size and the mass of the biosphere so that would be an interesting way of flipping nature around a little bit and examining it from different perspectives a different perspective looking from the looking at the spatial scale so that's certainly something that interests me longer term the, the one of the challenges with that kind of project which is actually one of the challenges with the nature fast and nature slow inquiry is how we actually define and define the individual. So while we can think about the oldest individual animals and plants, when animals and plants grow in in the form of colonies, they can reach, they can survive for much, much longer. That changes the inquiry a good deal. So while we've got, you know, some of the oldest animals being, what have I mentioned? I mentioned this, this Icelandic clam, and then we've got giant tortoises and so forth. These animals and the, the bowhead whale organisms, individual organisms that can live for, for centuries. When we look at colonial organisms, corals, for example, deep sea sponges called glass sponges, and these organisms can live as colonists for much, much longer. In that case, living for thousands and thousands of years. Quaking aspen is a famous example of of this in the American West, that the individual trees that you see in parts of Colorado, for example, where I've seen aspen groves, um, the individual stems rarely get, I mean, they, they have a lifespan similar to the human lifespan, but the whole colony might be immensely old, you know, 80,000 years or even more, dating back to the time when the, the ice sheets uh, re- last retracted from that part of, of North America. And so similarly there, we could look at that from the, from a spatial perspective, Spatial, we could look at that in terms of size and biomass and the quaking aspen as a whole colony is is is, is a rather weighty thing, whereas the individual stems, there's nothing particularly impressive there about them in terms of their, their individual biomass. And we see this this with, with fungi too, in terms of 
fungal colonies that can reach immense ages and weigh uh, weigh a great deal, weigh many tons. Did you, did you see like um, non-living things, non-living systems operate on all the same time scales as living systems, or were they more constrained or less constrained? Well, g- given that I'm looking here, at, I'm allowing this to extend to the time scale of billions of years. We don't know about anything that's that's persisted for longer than billions and billions of years. So indeed, all of all of nature, all of creation, if you like, does fit within this this time scale. It's just that biology on Earth is obviously not as old as our solar system, although it's not a great deal younger. And biology is a lot younger than the the age of the universe. But we're still looking at the time scale of billions of years. We don't know about things that have persisted for any longer than this. So what, what kind of comments have you gotten from the book being released? I don't know if it's released everywhere yet, but, um, you know, the early readers that looked at it or people that have commented on it, are you getting any strange responses or interesting responses? No, I think I'm still, I'm still waiting for that, that to occur. The book's sort of just been released. And so I'm still waiting for some, waiting for, for some more interesting comments, but get um, a lot of emails from people that are interested in some of the more philosophical questions i have had emails from people interested in the philosophical questions raised by the book so this this might be from readers that are not actually biologists but are, are interested in biology in a general sense but wondering what this some of the themes that i explore in the book what this may mean in philosophical terms how this affects the way that they might look at their lives okay well, very good where can people find uh, nature fast and nature slow is on Amazon Audible, Kindle, it's, where is it? Yeah, it, it's on, on Amazon. It's on all of the Amazons. And it's also in, in the United States. It's being uh, marketed through uh, University of Chicago Press. And so you can buy it directly from, from their website. The book's actually published by Reaction, which is based in, in London. Okay. And then, Nick, um, where can people find out more about your work and your other books? Where should they go? Yeah, if anybody would like to visit my website, which is themycologist.com I post there's a, there's a there's a blog on that also to which I contribute somewhat infrequently but there's a lot of information there on books and links to videos and um, other interviews and and um, other resources so yeah it'd be great if people would like to visit that site okay well very good yeah I've been going through the book it's, uh, it's very interesting I like hearing all these stories about different worlds that uh, are happening at the same time so Nick thank you for coming on the podcast thank you for coming Thanks. back Thank you again. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.